Hey y'all, in this video we're going to talk about inscribed angles. So first let's do a quick refresher of what an inscribed angle is. It is an angle drawn so that a vertex is on a circle and the sides of the angle are chords of that circle. And normally in these videos uh, I will introduce a thing and then we will explore the properties of the thing and then we will either outline or write a proof of the thing and then we have a conjecture uh, that we write down at the end. So in this case we're going to do things backwards. I'm actually going to give you the conjecture, like straight up just give it to you, uh, because the proof of it is not simple and direct. What's interesting for us about inscribed angles beyond the property that it, they have is how we have to prove it. It's going to be an introduction to you to a different kind of proof. Okay, one that's more complex than the ones you're used to seeing. All right, so the actual conjecture, we're going to number it C61, the inscribed angle conjecture, has two versions. Uh, the first version says the measure of an angle inscribed in a circle is one half the measure of the central angle. Now, as a consequence of the central angle, we also have version two, which says the measure of an inscribed angle in a circle is one half the measure of the intercepted arc. Okay, so depending on if we have central angles or arcs, we either want to use version one or version two. Okay, so I created this little drawing right here. Angle two is the inscribed angle. It intercepts arc A. Angle three is a central angle that also intercepts arc A. Now we know by the definition of measure of an arc that the measure of angle three is equal to the measure of arc A. Okay, and conjecture C61 says that angle two is one half of the measure of angle three, right? That's version one, that this angle is half of the other one. And if you just kind of look at it, it looks right. Angle three is bigger than angle two. Um, now, we use the definition of arc measure to say, well, let's ignore that central angle. If I just have the inscribed angle and that arc, and then I know this angle is half the measure of that arc. Now, of course, we're going to give you practice problems where you have to apply this knowledge, but I want to focus the rest of this video on how to prove this conjecture. Now, what sets this conjecture's proof apart from the other conjectures is that previous conjectures, I could draw a picture and create a series of arguments generic enough that encapsulated all of the possible uh, instances of that thing, right? Um, if I drew parallel lines in a transversal, it was generic enough that it would count for any set of parallel lines in any transversal drawn at it, no matter what angle they were at, right? Now, this technique of proof is used for things that are a little bit more complicated, where I cannot draw or create a single example or a single chain of reasoning that'll prove it for everything. Now we see this a lot in algebraic proofs for things like inequalities and things uh, that involve uh, positive and negative numbers like absolute values because those positives and negatives behave differently for inequalities and for absolute values that I sometimes have to break um, my proof up into something called cases, like the cases where they're both positive or where they're both negative, or one's positive and one's negative and one's zero. Now in geometry, the cases can be harder to come by. And we're actually going to start with the easiest case to prove. Now we're talking about inscribed angles and cases meaning different versions, and your brain might go to, well, there are different kinds of angles. So maybe there's a case with right angles or obtuse angles or acute angles, but that's not really what's happening for this particular conjecture. So if I think about this conjecture and I want to prove it, the easiest version for me to prove is when one side of the angle is actually the diameter of the circle, meaning the center of the circle is on a side of the angle. Okay, And you're like, okay, well, how is that easy to prove? Well, because I have these things called radii, which make you know a bunch of isosceles triangles. So if I go ahead and I take this one case, right, where the diameter is one side of an angle, and I add a radius in, right, to form a triangle, 
right? Remember, my job is to prove that angle A is half the measure of this arc, and I'm just going to call it B, right? So this arc has, uh, let's let's actually say this is, has arc has a measure of B degrees, okay? Instead of calling it arc B. So I drew that radius in, and I'm like, oh, okay, what does that give me? Well, that radius gives me an isosceles triangle, which I also know, therefore, that this angle here has to also be A degrees, okay? So I have a triangle, and you're like, okay, well, what does that help, right? It actually helps a lot, because when I drew in that radius that connected that cord to that center, I create this angle here, right? And this angle is an exterior angle of the triangle, right? And this angle is also a central angle of this triangle. And I know the measure of this angle because I know this arc is intercepted by this central angle. Therefore, this angle is B degrees. And so then I have to think back to exterior angles of triangles, right? Those external angles that are outside. And I remember a conjecture that says that this measure here, B, has to equal the sum of the remote interior angles. So not that angle, but those two, right? So it's actually A plus A, but the little degree symbol, shrink. So that means I have B is equal to 2A, and therefore A is equal to 1 half of B. So that means this angle measure is half that arc measure. Right, And that was pretty simply proven. I just had to add a radius in, use my isosceles triangles, use my uh, exterior angle there, and I have a proof. Now, yay, but do all inscribed angles have the center on the side of one of the angles? And the answer to that is no. So this, even though this is really relatively simple to prove, it doesn't prove it for all inscribed angles. It only proves it for the very specific case where the center is on the side, right? Where one of the sides of the angle is the diameter. So that actually tells me how to split up my proof. So this proof of this conjecture, if I were to write it, has three parts. One little proof of just case one, okay? Now once I've proven case one, the other cases are actually quite simple. But I need to find the cases first. And when I was in geometry, and actually all through math, one of the hardest things I had to do for me, well, hardest things for me to do in proof was to actually figure out which cases I had to prove. Now, when there are algebra proofs and numbers, it was usually a little bit easier because you have like zeros, negatives, and positives. You kind of have a way to, to break apart and separate out groups. Geometry, I thought it was a little bit harder personally. Okay, so if we know case one is where the center of the circle was on a side, well, case two can be, well, when the center of the circle is on the interior of the angle. And I'm like, well, how do I prove this? Well, actually quite simply, um, because I know how to prove things uh, with intercepted or inscribed angles with intercepted arcs when I have case one, when the diameter is there, right, as one of the sides of the angle. So why not just add a diameter in? Now, when I add a diameter in, Right, I create two separate little angles. Right, we'll call this one B and this one C. Right, now if I just look at angle B, isn't that just case one? Diameter is one side of the angle, right? Other one, angle C, same thing, that's just case one. So I could easily prove case two using case one. Right, I can say by case one, this angle B is one half of this measure here, right? And this angle C is one half of that measure there. And I can just add them together, right? Because I can add angles and I can add arcs. Case three is gonna be when the center of the circle is not inside or on the actual angle itself. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna draw that diameter in to create case one. So now, with that diameter drawn in, I can use case one to figure out this whole big angle related to this whole big uh, arc here. And so, but I only want this piece of it here, right? I only want this section of it. So what I can do is I can use case one to show that this angle is half of this whole big arc. 
And then I can use case 1 again to find out that this angle is half of that arc, and then just subtract them to get the one I need.